When people talk about game-changing or decisive weapons in Ukraine, I feel there's a tendency to focus on the big and the expensive. A lot of people would be able to tell you about Ukraine's Leopard tanks and upcoming F-16s. Start talking about uniforms, ration packs, body armor, or encrypted communications equipment by contrast, and you might not get the same level of recognition. I also think there's a tendency to focus on things that are actually offensive weapons. Think ATACMs and Javelin from Ukraine's allies, or hypersonics and glide bombs from Russia. And because of the media hype, I looked at some of those systems in a previous episode, and we'll look at some more today. But realistically, I think, assessing the impact of a system or trying to figure out what has shaped the way the war has played out often means looking a little more broadly. Sometimes a system or technology that wouldn't change much if used in isolation can dramatically change the proverbial rules of the game if you combine it with others. Just giving your artillery access to precision-guided missiles and rockets, for example, doesn't change much if they don't know where their targets are. But combine accurate and responsive artillery with drones to allow you to find the enemy and networks that allow you to get that information quickly to the guns, and suddenly you have a deadly transparent battlefield in which moving in the open is incredibly dangerous. Other systems might not generate much hype at all, but continue to be silent contributors. An example I'd look at here would be electronic warfare equipment, which by itself doesn't cause much in the way of flashy explosions, but does provide at least some answer to the proliferation of battlefield drones and precision-guided munitions. And so today, I'm going to look at some more potential game-changing systems in Ukraine, including both some that have attracted their fair share of public hype, but also zooming in on some, usually non-kinetic systems, that have played or may continue to play very important roles. To do that, I'm going to start with a little more theory and history around how you might assess a system's impact. In particular, I'm going to talk about how different systems and capabilities might be combined to create very different battlefield dynamics. I'm going to demonstrate some of that idea and the importance of context, by then evaluating two systems that I couldn't fit into my previous Game Changer episode. Those being the Kinsal hypersonic or aeroballistic missile for Russia, and the Storm Shadow and Scalp for Ukraine. Then we'll focus on some systems that have helped turn the battlefield in Ukraine into a highly transparent and dangerous one. Looking first at drones that can carry out reconnaissance missions, like Ukraine's TB2s and Russia's Orlans. Then critical networking and communication systems, like Starlink and Strelets before pivoting to some of the electronic warfare equipment that both sides, but particularly Russia, use for tasks like countering drones or intercepting and disrupting those networks. Then at the end, just for fun, we'll take the systems we've looked at and put them on the very unscientific Game Changer tier list that I developed last time. Will anything overtake HIMARS and Lancet at the top or join the Terminator at the bottom? Well, you can stick with me to the end to find out. But first, we're going to build a little more on the idea of what it takes to be a game-changing system. Last time, we looked at individual pieces of equipment and assessed them against three general criteria. The direct effect they'd had on the battlefield, the efficiency of their contribution, and then the but-for test, asking the question of what would have happened if that piece of equipment didn't exist. I think that's a useful way to think about this, but also a limited one. Because often the relevant question isn't just how much contribution does one individual system make, it's the net impact that multiple systems have once you start to operate them together to generate real capability. The basic idea here is that even if any one system might not necessarily change the way a war is fought, but if you bring enough of the right systems together in the right place at the right time, then the combined result may be far more dramatic and maybe we can even talk about that coveted Game Changer label. This is a small part of the reason why national strategies tend to start with the very big picture and then steadily zoom down until you're eventually talking about individual pieces of equipment. You generally don't want to go out and just buy whatever the internet says is the best fighter, the best tank, the best artillery piece on the market, but rather you're likely going to want to procure systems that give you the capability you need, taking into account all the other systems, doctrine, and structures that you have available. If you want an example of multiple systems coming together at one point to change the way a war is fought, World War I might stand out as a reasonable example. Here, multiple technologies and phenomena come together in a way that gave great advantages to the defender over any attacker. Heavy water-cooled machine guns massively increase the firepower of infantry operating on the defensive. Some of them are still being used in that role in Ukraine today. But while a small team could easily hold a defensive position with 65 kilograms of gun and tripod, most ordinary human beings would find it considerably harder to storm a trench with 65 kilograms of gun and tripod. The artillery of World War I was likewise more deadly, more accurate, and faster firing than it had been in previous conflicts. And by operation of some pretty basic rules of physics, those weapons would be considerably more lethal against targets that remained in the open for a protracted period of time, as opposed to those that were dug in in defensive positions, with as much dirt and concrete as possible between them and any incoming shrapnel. But to get the best possible value out of those guns, particularly the heavier versions with significant logistical trains, you need to prevent the fight becoming too dynamic. 
You can't have armies outflanking each other, breaking into the operational depths and cutting apart the logistics chain, for example. That's something that would have to wait for the sequel a couple of decades later. But for most of World War I on the Western Front, those sort of breakthroughs simply weren't practical. Modern, industrial, mobilised armies had simply gotten so large that they could man the entire front line and maintain a reserve. There were no longer any gaps. And then another innovation, barbed wire, allowed for troops with relatively little training and at very little expense to quickly throw up a barrier in no man's land or in front of their positions, which would then slow down any attacking infantry as they laboriously tried to breach or cut their way through. Now, in complete isolation, glorified chicken fencing probably wouldn't become a military game changer. But in the context of a larger collection of systems and circumstance, it became a tool of deadlock. Barbed wire would slow down attacks and allow the machine guns more time to engage. The artillery, meanwhile, would particularly punish exposed targets, readily finding and reinforcing its deadly place in this very attritional war. You can argue back and forth about how game-changing any of these individual technologies were. But the combination essentially helped write the rules for the so-called war to end all wars. And given the week in which this one is releasing, hopefully you'll forgive me for adding here, lest we forget. Another thing to say here is the system might be very decisive, important, arguably game-changing, even if instead of massively upending the dynamics of conflict, it instead helps keep them the same. This is a point that can sometimes come up in the debate over potential game-changing systems in Ukraine. You might have a commentator point to all these different systems, technology and resources being introduced on both sides, and yet the conflict still remaining relatively static and positional. Ipso facto, they might argue the game does not appear to have changed despite all these technologies being introduced, therefore none of these technologies were important, none of them were game changers. But what that sort of analysis might miss is the way in which newly introduced systems on both sides might be cancelling each other out, keeping the balance in check, and that if either side ever stopped introducing new technology systems or resources into the fight, well then eventually the dynamic might shift. For example, when Zeppelin airships were introduced as weapons during the First World War, Originally, they could basically bomb and reconnoiter at will. But as countermeasures like anti-aircraft guns and fighters with incendiary ammunition came onto the scene, well then suddenly the massive, slow-moving, flammable gas bags were pretty vulnerable targets, and their ability to be a game-changer was severely limited. The tank was a dramatically important weapon during the Second World War, but imagine how much more important it would have been if no one had ever bothered to invent and field the anti-tank gun. And the invention of various anti-submarine warfare equipment like sonar, hydrophones or anti-submarine torpedoes and depth charges often didn't so much totally upend the way naval warfare was going to be fought at the time, but instead prevented it devolving into a situation where submariners on both sides just competed to run up increasingly ridiculous tonnage counts as they cruised the world's oceans with the technological equivalent of wall hacks and god mode. If you're looking for an example from Ukraine of systems being greater than the sum of their individual parts, look no further than air defence, something we've talked about before. We're well over 600 days into this war, and Russian aircraft still can't fly deep penetration missions into Ukrainian airspace and vice versa. And no small part, that's because both sides have access to a lot of very powerful, very capable radar systems, started the war with large stocks of Soviet and post-Soviet missiles, some with very long ranges like the S-300, and had the systems and practices in place to coordinate between sensors and shooters, to make sure that when one of those powerful radars finds a target, the missile launch crews know about it. But the big example I'll try and use to illustrate today are the drivers of a transparent and dangerous battlefield. In Ukraine, it's become relatively easy to find targets, and where found targets are in exposed positions, very easy to engage and destroy those targets. Artillery fire and other effectors can be accurate and rapidly responsive, which makes attacking very difficult. But for this dynamic to evolve requires more than one game-changing system. It requires the tools to collect information quickly and en masse, to then network and share that information to get it to the relevant decision makers or weapons crews. And then of course you need the weapon systems that can convert coordinates into casualties in a timely and effective manner. Take away any single part of that particular triforce and the battlefield changes. No information, the guns don't know what to shoot at. You have the information but you can't get it to the guns, well, the guns still don't know what to shoot at. And of course, if you have the information gathering a network but no or insufficient fires, well, then you might learn everything there is to know about a potential threat and not be able to do anything about it. Sorry if that hits a bit too close to home for any academics in the audience. The core point is the impact of a system is dependent not just on the performance characteristics of the system itself, but the wider battlefield context, the other systems it operates alongside, the capability it generates in total, and how efficient and valuable that capability is in those circumstances. 
So to apply some of that thinking and refresh ourselves on how we might evaluate systems in Ukraine before we jump into more complicated topics like networking or electronic warfare, let's have a look at something just a bit simpler and much more explosive. This is the tale of two missile systems in Ukraine, each massively hyped up, each having been used under battlefield conditions in Ukraine, albeit with significantly different levels of impact. Let's look at Russia's Killjoy hypersonic or aeroballistic missile compared to the Franco-British Storm Shadow and Scalp air launch cruise missiles in use by Ukraine. We'll start with the Russian Kinzhal, NATO designation AS-24 Killjoy. Here I won't give too much background because we talked about this system in my video on hypersonics, so please go check that one out if you haven't already. But in essence, Killjoy is what happens when someone tells designers to make a hypersonic missile and they decide to rules lawyer their way out of the problem. Basically, the designers appear to have taken something that looks very much like the upper stage of an Iskander ballistic missile and they've mounted it on a MiG-31 or other airborne platform. That gives you a missile that will technically travel at hypersonic speeds for parts of its flight path. And of course, now that it's mounted on an aircraft, it might be more mobile in some senses than a ground-based launcher. To be fair, you should never underestimate the ability of a Slav and a heavy vehicle to conquer almost impossible ground terrain. But even the most intense dash cam footage in the world probably isn't going to show a bloke doing twice the speed of sound in a missile truck. As at time of recording, Ukrainian intelligence have recently claimed that Russia has about 80 killjoys in inventory and is producing about four per month. Assessing effect requires looking at how the missiles have been used in Ukraine and what sort of targets they've destroyed. Here, there are some points that are relatively uncontroversial, that Russia has used the killjoy missiles in Ukraine repeatedly, that they were, for example, used in May, August, September and other points, and that we're often seeing multiple missiles fired together rather than them being used individually. From there, the fog of war starts to close in, however, and things get a little more contested. The Ukrainians, for example, claim that some of their air defence systems, notably Patriot, can shoot down and has shot down some incoming Killjoy missiles. For their part, Russian state media claims that Kinzhal cannot be intercepted by Western air defence systems, hasn't in fact been intercepted by those systems, and that the whole claim is just intended to, quote, justify its overexpending of ammunition for Western-supplied air defence systems, end quote. In fact, Russian claims back in May sort of reversed it to a Killjoy Hunts Patriot sort of scenario, and the Russian Defense Ministry and Russian state media published claims that a single Kinzhal missile had destroyed five Patriot launchers and a multifunctional radar. An achievement that was obviously extremely remarkable for a single missile, given that Patriot launchers and radars tend to be distributed over a wide area, they're not all clumped in one spot, and the fact the Russian command doesn't appear to have made any significant attempt to capitalise on the weakness of Kyiv's air defences caused by the destruction of all of these Patriot launchers and sensors. And while the Ukrainians claim that at least some of the missiles that get through have hit civil infrastructure, or in one case a private house, something we would attribute a score of less than zero in our system if we were evaluating the effects of a strike, you also have some pro-Russian sources claiming much more effective strikes. For example, the story that just won't die of a dagger somehow penetrating a command bunker 130 metres underground and killing dozens or hundreds of NATO officers in Ukraine. Now, that claim obviously raised just, just a few questions regarding its plausibility. For example, why would hundreds of officers, including dozens or hundreds of NATO officers, be in a single bunker in Ukraine? Why did no one in this scenario decide to work from home? And how on earth did anyone in any NATO country not notice all of these officers going missing? But extreme claims aside, we just don't have that much evidence for significant Kinzhal strikes in Ukraine. We know that some missiles have gotten through and hit things, and where they have been claimed shot down, I'd like to stress we don't know how many interceptors it took to shoot those missiles down, but as the evidence stands now from what I've seen, I don't think there's sufficient evidence to conclude that Russia's done significant damage to the Ukrainian military with the limited number of strikes it's carried out so far. But if that's effectiveness, there's then the question of efficiency. How many resources has Kinzhal absorbed in order to have the effects it's had? And here, at least so far, the system seems designed to cause the maximum amount of emotional pain possible to my inner defence economist. The fact that Killjoy exists means that it had its own development and testing process, its own production line, its own deployment separate from regular Iskander missiles, it means somewhere there is a production chain that exists only so a handful of these can be artisanally assembled every month. And, perhaps most damningly for me, most Kinsale deployments have depended on modifying a number of MiG-31 interceptors to carry and fire them. Personally, I think there's a lot of good things to say about the MiG-31 platform. It's fast, it has a beefy radar, and it can carry some very long-range, very heavy and dangerous air-to-air -air missiles. 
MiG-31s have been in great demand in the VKS flying combat air patrol and firing long-range missiles at Ukrainian aircraft. Demand that is all the more painful because these airframes are no longer in new build production and have relatively short airframe lives. And yet, for the privilege of testing and firing Kinsal, the Russians have modified 10 MiG-31s to the K standard, so they're not very good fighters anymore, and in so doing converted a valuable and almost irreplaceable interceptor into a standoff missile launch platform. Recent reports that Russia may have modified a Sukhoi-34 to carry and launch these missiles are promising because it might take pressure off the 31 fleet, but it isn't without its own costs and it doesn't entirely offset that which has already been done. To me, it seems like you can't walk past the opportunity cost that comes from firing Kinzhal from the MiG-31 platform. To me, it'd be kind of like using the space shuttle to deliver mail. Yes, you could technically do it, but with an efficiency level that basically amounts to setting money on fire which probably means the first company to pitch space mail will raise billions from investors. But that doesn't change the fact that Kinsale is a very expensive solution to a problem I'd argue the Russians had already mostly solved. Because remember, the third metric I proposed is asking yourself the question, what would have happened if this system hadn't been deployed in Ukraine? And the honest answer I think so far is just like the BMPT that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, not much changes. Russia still has significant numbers of ground-launched disc and ballistic missiles. We saw early in the war that these can have penetration aids and they still necessitate significant missile defence resources. Plus, Russia has air-launched cruise missiles with considerably longer reach than the Killjoy and, of course, the Shahed-136 drones. So Russia still has the vast majority of its systems capable of hitting Ukrainian rear area targets. It still imposes significant challenges on Ukrainian air defences. And it even still basically requires Ukraine to seek out systems with anti-ballistic capability, things like Patriot or SAMP-T, because there is still the threat of the Iskander ballistic missiles or potentially further ballistic missiles from Iran in the future, as we discussed last week. Add to this the fact that ground launching your Iskanders doesn't provide the Ukrainians the same warning they currently get every time the specially modified MiG-31s take off, and the fact that because you have considerably more Iskander launches than you do aircraft modified to fire the Killjoy, you can launch considerably larger salvos of Iskander, something which there's a possibility we'll see this coming winter. And so far, I'd argue in Ukraine, there hasn't really been an itch for the Killjoy to scratch. So if we use our regular criteria, things start to get pretty ugly pretty quickly. In terms of effectiveness, there just haven't been that many Killjoy strikes to begin with. A number of them have missed. Some have been claimed intercepted. And while it's obviously possible the Russian MOD might be holding back visual evidence of successful strikes on high-value targets, as it stands, there's a huge amount more in terms of visual evidence for successful and damaging Iskander strikes than there is for the Killjoy. In terms of efficiency, it's got to be an F-grade for me. This is a weapon you could fire against high-value targets, and it's probably going to be expensive to intercept. Patriot or SAMPT interceptors, which are the primary systems Ukraine might use, obviously don't grow on trees. But that rationale also applies to other Russian systems, including Iskander, and those don't require you to permanently modify and retask a squadron of valuable and irreplaceable interceptors into missile launch platforms. The use of those MiG-31 airframes to, on an average basis, fire less than one missile per aircraft per month is for me an opportunity cost so high, particularly given the small number of missiles involved, that as with the BMPT, I'm left questioning whether or not Russia would have been better off if it never built these systems at all. That's only reinforced for me once you consider the but for test. I expect the Killjoy will be used again in Ukraine. They may even hit some valuable targets and win some headlines. It's a quick dangerous missile, so that wouldn't surprise me. But in a world where it didn't exist, almost all the things Russia is using this missile for could be done more efficiently by another system that Russia already has. You could construct scenarios where it filled a niche. For example, if the MiG-31s could fly into Ukrainian territory, then the missile would have a longer range than Iskander. But Ukrainian airspace is denied to the VKS, so that doesn't really matter. You could imagine it being used as an anti-shipping weapon, but we don't have any evidence that Russia has the capability to hit moving targets with this thing. In other words, it just isn't supported by the other sort of systems and capabilities it would need in order to make a more extensive contribution. And so, for dismally failing to live up to the hype afforded the system, I'm going to put Kinzhal alongside BMPT at the bottom of the tier list which I understand might sting a little for a country that has so many good rockets and missiles in its inventory. The comparison then for the Killjoy might be something like the Storm Shadow and Scalp air-launched cruise missiles supplied to Ukraine by France and Britain. These are very technically different from the Kinzhal, but they share at least some role overlap. It's a long-range PGM you fire from an aircraft to destroy very valuable targets. And like Kinzhal, it received a lot of media hype before its first use in Ukraine, 
but the evidence for the results of that usage are very, very different. We don't have firm figures for how many storm shadows have been sent to Ukraine, how many have been fired, and as a result, how much that commitment costs. What we do have are some soft upper limits. We know that the original French order for the missile was only about 500, the RAF one was somewhat higher, and we also know that in both cases, some missiles have been fired, some sent into storage and aren't ready to be used, and some are of the wrong version. Add in the estimated cost of the missile, running into seven figures, and the scale of Britain's disclosed financial contributions to Ukraine, and I'd roughly guess that all storm shadows fired in Ukraine so far have hit the nine-figure range in US dollar terms. In reality, of course, the weapons already existed, had been paid for many, many years ago, and a replacement program is already in the works. But for the key point here, I think, to look at for efficiency and effectiveness is what targets Storm Shadow and Scalp are believed to have destroyed. Now, the missiles have been used against a variety of targets, including bridges, but arguably the missile's most interesting use case has been as part of Ukraine's vendetta against the Russian Black Sea Fleet. Storm Shadows and Scalps have repeatedly been used to strike high-value targets, and to demonstrate that perhaps Crimea isn't the best neighbourhood to be parking your warships. In September, these missiles hit the submarine Rostov-on-Don in dry dock, as well as the landing ship Minsk. Both were valuable, expensive vessels, invaluable and expensive infrastructure, and in the case of the submarine Rostov-on-Don, it was also a potential cruise missile launch platform. Then on the 4th of November, at least three of these missiles either struck or struck near a Russian Karakut-class corvette. That's not a particularly large class of warship, but warships don't come cheap. So in dollar-to-dollar terms, you could fire a salvo of 10 or 12 missiles at this thing and probably still be pretty efficient, and that's before you account for the opportunity cost to the Russians of losing yet another potential calibre launch platform. The two reasons I bring up these strikes is because one, we have corroborating evidence for them, including visual evidence, and two, because they represent hits on valuable, what should be very well defended targets in Russian rear areas, in a way which might have operational significance, that is, pushing more and more Russian naval assets further and further away from Crimea. These are major effects, delivered against targets valuable enough to make the strikes potentially efficient. And if you do the but-for test, where you ask how different would the world be if Storm Shadow and Scalp hadn't gone to Ukraine, then you get a different result than with Russia's hypersonic. Kill Russia's joy by taking away the Kinsal, and they still have plenty of missiles capable of doing long-range precision strikes. But without Storm Shadow and Scalp, Ukraine's ability to strike hard and precisely at distance were very limited. The Tochka TBMs they started the war with have largely been depleted and weren't that accurate to begin with. Ukraine's own domestic TBMs are not yet a battlefield factor, and missiles repurposed to ground strike, like S-200s or Neptunes, just don't offer the same capabilities as the purpose-built Storm Shadow and Scalp. So in the absence of Storm Shadow and Scalp, Russia doesn't have to worry about missile attack on targets, for example, in Crimea the same way it currently does. It doesn't have to divert the same air defence assets, it doesn't have to rebase significant elements of the Black Sea Fleet, and it doesn't take the critical losses to shipping or rear area infrastructure that it has. Russia probably doesn't have to invest the same resources in trying to hunt down the Sukhoi-24 fleet, And to broaden it out a little bit, Ukraine probably doesn't have anywhere near the same political leverage it currently has to try and seek out systems like ATACMS, the German Taurus, or in the future, American-manufactured air-launched cruise missiles. So there's a lot of differences here that lead to a very different evaluation. The visually confirmed impact on Russian high-value targets, and also the impact on Russian decision-making, is pretty evident. The efficiency of the strikes overall has been high but not perfect. Some have been intercepted or hit low-value targets but others have hit very expensive or irreplaceable infrastructure or systems. The introduction of the missiles has arguably forced Russian adaptations and leveraged a system the Ukrainians already had, the Sukhoi-24, that unlike Russia's MiG-31s, didn't have anything better to do with their time than slinging long-range missiles. According to our criteria, Storm Shadow is mostly held back by the inability to scale it. There aren't that many missiles in existence to begin with, only a fraction of them will make their way to Ukraine, and Ukraine is limited in terms of its number of launch platforms. So while Storm Shadow and Scalp can be impactful, dozens of strikes are never going to move the needle in the way a thousand might. You can make arguments either way, but I'm tempted to place the missile alongside HIMARS and Lancet, but with a giant asterisk. Like them, it lives up to hype, is effective, efficient, and forces adaptation, but given the lack of scale, only its uniqueness prevents it dropping down a tier. A closing note there might be that Russia also has its own cruise missiles and that they're available in larger numbers. There are different factors we could go into as to why Ukraine might sometimes get better use out of theirs, but one potential culprit might be a superiority in intelligence and target identification. Throughout this war, Russia has probably always held a significant advantage in overall firepower. 
But through the fog of war, at least, it often seems like Ukraine has better access to targeting information and intelligence. This might come from commercial satellites, informants behind the lines, or information provided by allied intelligence. But for whatever reason, while Russia often seems slow to accurately identify and then surface targets, Ukraine seems to struggle less with finding targets worth hitting and more with finding the weapons with which to hit them. But either way, the key is that actionable intelligence is valuable. And as we start talking about other systems that might deserve the label Game Changer, you'll probably notice that information is often at the heart of their mission. Okay, so now we've reached the point of the video where I promised I'd nominate some decisive systems or if you insist on using the term Game Changers of my own. And here, for the sake of both time and completeness, I'm going to cheat a little bit and talk about capabilities and families of systems rather than an individual piece of equipment. Okay, so if your first step is to clear the fog of war and find your enemy on the battlefield, the obvious nomination would probably be small unmanned aerial systems. These often commercial off-the-shelf drones have been one of the defining features of the war in Ukraine and have been used in their tens of thousands. But they're at once both so impactful and constantly changing that they probably deserve their own video, while at the same time they only answer part of the reconnaissance and intelligence question. Some of these drones might be limited in terms of range or onboard sensor package, for example. And so in Ukraine, we've still seen both sides use more expensive purpose-built drones with more advanced onboard sensors or greater endurance. These include the hugely famous Bayraktar TB2 used by the Ukrainians, and also slightly lesser known, smaller, cheaper designs like the Orlan 10 and 30 used by the armed forces of the Russian Federation. There are a number of comments on my last Game Changer video asking why TB2 hadn't been included. The answer, it turns out, is because I'm going to cover it now. The TB2 absolutely rocketed, or should I say propelled itself, to public prominence in the early days of Russia's full-scale invasion. Campaigning for public prominence and airtime against systems like Javelin, Enlor, and Stugna, the TB2 had the massive advantage of having the onboard sensor suite. So the public didn't have to be told about a Russian invasion going wrong and this supposedly game-changing system, they could be shown it. And when it comes to building public hype, sometimes a one-minute video of air defense systems being smacked by a drone is worth a thousand press releases. At the time, the videos certainly caught our attention. These results were so remarkable that I went through them in one of the first videos I made on the war in Ukraine. Because everything we thought we knew about the TB2 said it should have been shot out of the sky by Russian air defense systems. What the theory said it definitely shouldn't be doing was loitering over Russian armored columns, plinking at books and tours, like the operator had just unlocked a drone kill streak in Call of Duty. In those first two weeks, we weren't exactly sure how this was happening and whether it would continue happening, only that theoretically it shouldn't. But as was so often the case throughout history, whenever theory and practice go up against each other, practice has a way of yanking the book out of theory's hands and punching him in the face. And so the TB2 became a superweapon, a media sensation. In the eyes of some, it became, as this article from May 2022 put it, the drone that changed the nature of warfare. And while the system was doing work on the battlefields north of Kyiv, it was also succeeding on the only slightly less important front of YouTube. The Ukrainians made a song about the TB2 doing its thing, it was a little catchy, and so when I went to check for this video, just the first couple of remixes of that song had more than 10 million collective views. This was a system the public hyped, and it was a system governments seemed to be buying in ever greater quantities. Then, quietly in the background, the honeymoon began to end. Russian air defences, which had been turned off to avoid friendly fire risk, inadequately supplied or poorly organised, steadily sorted themselves out. And once that happened, TB2 losses began to mount, and using them in direct strike roles became less and less viable. And more or less since that point, the TB2 has spent a lot more time being flown relatively conservative in a standoff reconnaissance role, as opposed to attacking targets directly the way it did in those first critical hours and days. But if we want to get some indicators of effectiveness and efficiency, we first have to understand roughly how much the Ukrainian TB2 fleet cost. Pricing always varies on method and based on the inclusions and exclusions in any particular contract, but based on some of the crowdfunded purchases and press releases, I'm going to go with a nice clean figure of about 5 million euros or 5.4 million US per drone. Take the estimated Ukrainian fleet, conveniently forget that some of them were donated or crowdfunded, and without getting into secondary costs like training, sustainment, or munitions, we get a very, very rough estimate of about 400 million US dollars for the fleet. We also, in turn, have visual confirmation of 24 TB2s being lost for an approximate cost of 130 million. Balanced against that, at the very least, we have to consider the value of the targets the TB2s have destroyed. At time of recording, those figures are five tanks, seven AFEs, nine artillery pieces, two jammers, an MI8 helicopter, 
meaning that unless you count balloons, the TB2 has destroyed more enemy aircraft than the F-22 Raptor, and then half a dozen boats and two fuel logistics trains, which already isn't bad considering the scope of known TB2 losses. There could of course be TB2s that were lost without corresponding visual evidence, and the Russian MOD, as it tends to do, has reported a sterling performance by Russia's air defence forces, destroying more than the entire Ukrainian estimated TB2 fleet. But even if Russian ground-based air defences manage to wipe out the entire Ukrainian TB2 fleet for real this time, they might still be haunted by the terrible costs incurred in the war's critical opening weeks. Because back then the TB2s ran up a massive tally against expensive air defence systems that are meant to be able to shoot things like it down. Overall, we got video evidence of the TB2s destroying eight tour systems, seven books, and a pansier. And those books, tours, and pansiers were all individually many times more expensive than any given TB2 drone. And even if their destruction had cost Ukraine its entire initial operating TB2 force, which it didn't because they continued flying, this still, on paper, would have been a great trade for Ukraine in dollar-to-dollar terms. To say nothing of the fact that Ukraine obviously didn't lose any pilots operating its TB2s, while there is a significant chance that at least some of those Russian systems were, at the time of their destruction, crewed by trained, pre-war air defence professional soldiers. You may also want to give the TB2 partial credit for certain high-profile strikes, like the sinking of the Moskva. There, the published claims, very much unconfirmed, are that the TB2s were involved in potentially distracting the ship while it was struck with Neptune missiles. For the modern Russian Navy, these Slava-class cruisers are essentially impossible to replace in the near term and building a full-size missile cruiser in 2023 or 2024 may well cost more than every TB2 in Ukrainian service. But how you factor that into your potential evaluation probably depends both on what you believe actually happened, and second, whether philosophically you care who makes the pass or only who shoots the goal. But in any case, where does that leave us roughly assessing TB2 in Ukraine? The answer to whether or not it fundamentally changed the way that war in Ukraine is fought is probably a no. It had an outsized impact in the first days of the war, but since then has become very much a secondary system. The answer to whether or not it was cost-effective, I think, has to be a yes, largely based on the results it racked up in those opening days. And for example, to this point, TB2 still accounts for a bit more than 15% of all visually confirmed Russian tour losses in Ukraine. And if the TB2 had continued destroying Russian air defence systems at the same rate it did in those initial days and weeks, then by this point, Private Conscriptovich would be trying to shoot down Ukrainian aircraft using his Kalashnikov. But the adaptation did happen, the rampage stopped, and since then the TB2's missions have been more focused on softer contributions like gathering intelligence as opposed to direct strike. In that sense, I feel the TB2's evaluation is kind of like the one we gave Javelin, but more extreme. It outperformed the hype early, and then just as the hype was mounting, it started to drop off. It had a physical and morale effect, but not a decisive one, and it was efficient, but not the most efficient. That means on our table it can share a spot with the Javelin in view of its early war performance, but if you were to rate it only on the last 6-12 to months, there's a strong case for dropping it down a tier to sit alongside Western main battle tanks and the Russian TOS 1A. But look, as we said, everyone talks about the TB2. By contrast, Russia's flagship drone systems don't seem to get anywhere near as much airtime. Given the role they play, I think they deserve a little more spotlight. And so today I'm going to look at some of Russia's more common drone systems in the Orlan series. The two drones we're talking about, the Orlan 10 and the Orlan 30, sit in a sort of space between something like the TB2 at one extreme and a civilian quad rotor on the other. Like the TB2, this is a fixed-wing reconnaissance drone. But like the cheap quad rotors, they're intended to be used by troops in the field, not launched off a runway. And in terms of pricing, they occupy again a middle position. The Orlan 10 is the baseline model and it comes in at a very approximate cost of about 100,000 US dollars per unit. That makes it perhaps 50 times cheaper than a Bayraktar TB2, but at the same time, 20 or more times more expensive than a civilian quad rotor. The Orlan 30 on the top there is a more advanced model that adds a number of additional capabilities. Most critically, the system has a laser designator, which is important for supporting laser-guided Russian weapons like the Krasnopol-guided shells, and the Russians indicate that it can also generate and supply the GPS coordinates for targets it's spotting. Now, I need to stress here, these systems are not particularly fancy, they are not gold-plated. Every time we've seen video or imagery of an Orlan 10 which has crashed or is being disassembled, you'll usually see evidence of lots of commercial off-the-shelf components, very basic internals, sometimes inconsistent worksmanship. And especially when you're talking about the Orlan 10, the sensors and image quality aren't really that competitive with a lot of the other things on the market. There's even a pretty strong case to be made based on what's inside an Orlan 10, that the system is far too expensive for what it is. 
When you tally up the value of all the known off-the-shelf components and factor in labour, then you can argue the All-On 10 in particular should probably be cheaper than it supposedly is. But who knows, maybe it's tough days for the oligarch yacht market and they really need some stimulus money. The more important point here, I think, is that it's easy to point at these systems and laugh at the off-the-shelf components or the plastic fuel tank and miss the basic point that this is a basic system which occupies something of a sweet spot. Because these are larger fixed-wing designs, they can fly higher and further than a commercial quadrotor. They can fly high enough to be out of range of many defensive options, while at the same time being common enough and cheap enough to not be worth engaging with a more expensive anti-aircraft missile like a book or a tour. And yet, even though the sensors may not exactly be award-winning, they're good enough that sometimes Ukraine might be forced to shoot down these drones anyway, because sometimes wasting a missile on a $100,000 drone is a much better idea than waiting for the Russian artillery to be queued onto your position. The Orlans seem to be simple enough and cheap enough to be well within Russia's industrial capability to manufacture in decent numbers. And while I would always advise taking Russian MOD claims with an absolute grain of salt, while Sergei Shoigu claims things like 2.1 times increases for BMP3 production, the figure he gives to the Orlans series is a 53 times increase from the start of 2022. Of course, it is reported that the Orlans shot down in Ukraine tend to be full of Western components. These reportedly include export-controlled components from the United States, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. For those of you interested in that investigation, I'll leave a link in the description. But if Russia is able to continue getting those components or a substitute, despite sanctions, even if it has to pay a premium, then the All Arms will continue rolling off the production lines in far greater numbers than things like the TB2. And in this sort of drone warfare, quantity absolutely has a quality all of its own. And in terms of how it's used and the impact it has, the All Arms seem to be good enough to have become a critical part of Russia's kill chain. In one of their reports earlier this year, Rusi noted the importance of the Orlan system in coordinating Russian fires. They noted that, quote, each commander of an Axis will generally retain an orbit of Orlan 10s above the fighting to provide both information to the CP and targets for responsive and accurate fire, end quote. They also noted Russian artillery brigades were being given Orlans to make it easier for them to find their targets, and that, quote, Ukrainian forces often find that they are being observed by two different Orlan 10 complexes each able to call down different effects, end quote. That accords with statements I've seen by other Ukrainian commanders who remark they often have all arms circling above or near their units, but in the end they just don't have enough air defence assets, particularly very close to the front line, to be able to expend missiles shooting the things down. The all arm 10 is essentially good enough to be very useful, but too shit to be worth killing with most of the available Ukrainian systems. The all arm 30s are more dangerous again, because they can laser-designate targets. While most NATO precision artillery shells tend to rely on GPS or inertial navigation, the Russian equivalent is reliant on that laser designation. Both systems obviously have their own vulnerabilities. GPS requires you to have a valid GPS signal, and laser guidance requires you to have something there to laser designate. And while there are different ways to get a laser on a target, an Orlan is one commonly used way to do it. The Orlans are also commonly paired up with Lancet loitering munitions. The Orlan finds the target, helps cue in the Lancet, and observes the strike. And given how much pain Lancet loitering munitions have inflicted particularly on the Ukrainian artillery, even just playing the teammate role for the Lancet is probably worth some decent effectiveness points for the spotter. It also helps highlight again the importance of context and other systems. Storm Shadow and Atakums were particularly valuable to Ukraine because it seems to have good intelligence, but relatively few weapons to hit targets at long ranges. Russia, by contrast, has a lot of firepower available to it on tap in various forms, everything from glide bombs to artillery barrages to lancets, so it stands to benefit greatly whenever it gets better at finding targets and queuing those fires onto them. Yes, a lot of the time, Russian drone footage might have the resolution of an early 90s TV show broadcast during a thunderstorm, but given all the firepower the Russians have available to them, the Ukrainian defenders probably often don't care whether or not they're being spotted in 4K Ultra HD. So where does that put the All Arms series on our Game Changer list? And here, while there may be better options available to other militaries, for Russia in Ukraine, I think this system gets pretty high marks. In terms of effect, the All Arms don't directly destroy any targets themselves, but they probably get at least partial credit for a lot of the hits by Lancet, attacks by Krasnopol precision-guided shells, or indeed a lot of Russian fires in general which are often spotted for and corrected by these systems. We already rated the Lancets pretty highly, which speaks in favour of these drones too. In terms of efficiency, the All Arms might be overpriced, but they're still very cheap. Even if we took the visually confirmed loss figure for these drones, 159 All Arm 10s at time of recording, 
multiplied it by three and then took the $100,000 estimate for building these things, then the total cost of all those losses would still be less than $50 million. That's not nothing, but in the context of a war which destroys multi-million dollar tanks, helicopters, jets, ships or submarines on a regular basis, I'd argue it's probably a pretty efficient investment in getting more out of Russia's fires. Finally, trying to apply the but for test, if all the Orlan drones disappeared, there'd be a question of how Russia would leverage a lot of the other systems it has. Without the Orlan 30, you're more limited in the systems you have that can designate for Krasnopol. Without the Orlans, you're more limited in your ability to queue and control lancets behind the lines. And without Orlan, the overall efficiency of the Russian artillery is going to take a hit. So despite having received very little public hype and a lot of public criticism, I actually think the Orlan series belongs up there alongside Lancet and HIMARS, and potentially above systems like Javelin, the TB2, or Storm Shadow. Information gathering and correcting is just too valuable in terms of getting firepower on target. And for all its shortcomings, Orlan is one way for Russia to get that information. Of course, all the information in the world doesn't do you much good if you can't share it and get it to the people who need it. You can spot all the targets you like, but it's not going to do you any good if you can't get that information to a decision maker, and then from the decision maker to a gun crew or other system that can dispatch the welcome to Ukraine message in the now traditional high explosive fashion. And more broadly than that, but without going into a level of detail I'm not comfortable with, the war in Ukraine is also proving the value of adequate networking, where commanders and decision makers are increasingly able to perceive the battlefield almost in real time allowing the force to better coordinate, robbing attacking forces of the element of surprise. And so we've seen both sides use a variety of tools to allow commanders and units to network and coordinate. These include dedicated military platforms intended for that purpose, but also just by virtue of having mobilised armies in a state of emergency, we've also seen a lot of civilian products used. For an outsider, the way things work in Ukraine can sometimes be a little strange to start with. You might have people legitimately sending scans of official paper documents, using their civilian Gmail accounts because they don't have an official one. We also have reports of Ukrainian units using everything from Google Meets to Discord to coordinate actions and share video feeds. It may not be what authors in the past envisaged for warfare in 2023, but at one point during this war in Ukraine, you probably wouldn't have been shocked if you'd been told to jump on a work meeting on Zoom, Discord or a number of other programs, only to log in and see Orc Slayer 1988 and Pow Lift Bro 93 passionately discussing what to do about a Russian mechanised infantry platoon that had just been spotted on a live drone feed. Practices have obviously continued to evolve as the war has continued, but the key value there is the importance of good communication and the particular value of a stable internet connection, because there is just so much you can do with a proper network link that you can't do with a regular radio. And so for Ukraine, I'm actually going to nominate SpaceX's Starlink as a potential game-changing system. Starlink is a satellite-based internet service provided by SpaceX, which uses massive constellations of satellites in very low orbits, in large part because that allows you to deliver lower latency times than using satellites that are positioned further away. Starlink terminals are relatively small and mobile, you don't have to set up a massive communication dish or anything, and they provide the operator critically with the ability to access the internet and upload and download data without being reliant on local internet or telecommunication infrastructure. The original intention, I believe, was that this could be used in rural, remote, or austere environments that might not have access to their own permanent infrastructure. And you know what? Battlefields can be pretty austere environments. Telecommunication and internet infrastructure can be disrupted or bombed. The power can go out. And in past NATO or American campaigns, we've often seen local communication infrastructure being bombed and disrupted. But on paper with Starlink, that's not an issue. In order to stop the signal, you need to find a way to either jam or interfere with it, which so far has proven mostly unsuccessful, shoot down the satellites, which would be an act of war, or bomb each individual Starlink terminal. That's obviously not particularly practical, so now you have a system that can give operators, even in very austere environments or close to the front line, the ability to get access to an internet connection and potentially reduce their reliance on things like radio or other systems. Over time, the system has become massively important in supporting communication and internet access in Ukraine. The country is one of the few places around the world where the network is often at capacity, and an estimate for the number of terminals in the country run from 40 or 45,000 at the low end 
to perhaps very approximately 100,000 at the high end once you take account of systems that are held in reserve as replacements or owned by civilian businesses or ordinary members of the public. Some will be used for military communication, others to provide internet access at emergency shelters. And on the civilian side, I know a number of businesses or individuals in Ukraine who have invested in a Starlink terminal just to make sure they're not reliant on the local network and can remain mobile. Initially, Ukraine was receiving a number of Starlink terminals and services for free with SpaceX essentially absorbing the ongoing cost of providing the connection. Eventually that policy changed, but foreign governments continued to donate terminals or subsidise the cost of connection. Germany, for example, is believed to have been a major donor of terminals, while SpaceX themselves have reportedly remained active in resisting Russian electronic warfare efforts and continuing to iterate the system. And if you're looking for evidence of its value beyond just the comments of Ukrainians themselves, the number of terminals, the demand for bandwidth, and the continued provision of new terminals by foreign donors are all pretty strong indicators. As, it might be argued, is the controversy caused whenever the system is unavailable. Back in September this year, for example, there was considerable coverage in the media about the fact that Starlink didn't activate its services around Crimea when requested by the Ukrainians. As the story was reported, under ordinary circumstances, Starlink terminals won't connect if you have them in Russian-controlled territory. This effectively prevents them being used by the Russian military on their side of the front line. At one point, Ukraine reportedly requested that service in Crimea be temporarily turned on so that naval drones equipped with Starlink could be used to attack the Russian fleet at anchor. Elon Musk reportedly refused that request and has made several statements as to his reasons for doing so. But wherever you stand on the issue, one of the key observations many in government and the media were quick to make was that essentially the control over a vitally important communication system for Ukrainian civilians, government and military organisations rested in the hands of a private company, which practically had the ability to grant or withdraw service to any area more or less at will. As a government, if nothing else, that's a bit of a policy challenge. We have seen a number of policy responses in turn, including things like the Starshield program, essentially the military equivalent to Starlink, and a number of special agreements entered into between the Pentagon and SpaceX. But whatever the controversy as it currently stands, the Pentagon describes Starlink as, quote, a vital layer in Ukraine's overall communication network, end quote. And of all those I've spoken to in Ukraine, I've yet to find anyone who disagrees. At the risk of oversimplifying things, the Ukrainian way of war relies on communication, and a lot of the time, Ukrainian communications rely on Starlink. And so from an efficiency, effectiveness, and but-for perspective, I'd argue Starlink is pretty basal to a lot of what the Ukrainian government, people, and military are able to accomplish. And so for the first time, I'm going to slot it in on the currently empty top level of our tier list. It's worth noting the Russian military has some of its own valuable communication systems and networking tools. For example, one of the drivers that RUSI researchers credit with the increasing responsiveness of Russian fires is the so-called Strelets system, which allows for better connection at the tactical level between sensors like reconnaissance troops and the artillery batteries or fires that are going to service the targets they identify. We'll probably talk about the system more next time we do a deep dive into the Russian artillery and its ongoing evolution. But for now, it's enough to say that even though Russian leaders might describe American forces, for example, having an advantage in terms of technology and communications and networking, that doesn't mean the Russian army doesn't have some of those capabilities, that it isn't actively seeking more, and that it isn't able to get value out of some of those it's deployed in Ukraine. None of them may operate on the same scale or with the same impact as something transformational like Starlink, but they're very much real and they're very much there. So in summary, the battlefields of Ukraine are obviously very dangerous places. Drones and reconnaissance systems offer new and ever more efficient ways to find you, and networking tools and systems allow that discovery to be converted into you having a very bad day. Whether that's because the enemy forces assaulting your position now know exactly where you are, you're about to be hit with an artillery strike, or the drone operators decide to keep it in the family, so to speak, by tasking your destruction to a loitering munition or an FPV team. But despite how horrifying that sounds, and it is horrifying, under different circumstances, it could probably be a lot, lot worse. Because while drones, communications and networks change the game, there are other types of systems constantly operating to keep them at least somewhat in check. And perhaps the biggest factor I'd fit into that category, even though it doesn't get a huge amount of public attention, is electronic warfare. I'm always nervous talking about EW in Ukraine because it is a pretty sensitive topic. But to do this episode properly, there's no way to leave it entirely out. This is war on or for the electromagnetic spectrum. And it can include a wide range of activities, including jamming, intercepting, 
or imitating enemy communications and signals. Fool an enemy GPS munition by convincing it's in the wrong place, causing it to miss, for example, and you're doing electronic warfare. Russia, like the Soviet Union before it, is a country which places immense focus on electronic warfare. While some very public Western developments in the field over the last several decades have focused on lower-end threats, like reducing the threat caused by remote detonated IEDs, for example, Russian EW capabilities reflect at least some concern with fighting an equal or stronger opponent. One of the key figures in Russian electronic warfare, General Lestochkin, reportedly gave an interview back in 2017 where he talked about the threat posed by the NATO advantage in technology, communications and networking. He talked about what he described as the introduction of modern electronic technologies in the command and control systems of US forces, and the way those technologies and the global strike concept they support, quote, substantially increases the level of threat to the military security of the Russian Federation and fundamentally changes the character and content of the armed struggle, end quote. In other words, there was an understanding here that US forces in particular would have an advantage when it came to collecting information and then leveraging that information through their networks and efficient command and control systems. Now, theoretically, Russia could try and match the US and certain other NATO powers, technology for technology, capability for capability. But that would require a heck of a lot of money, modernization, and some potentially uncomfortable military reforms. So instead, people like Lestoch can put the focus on systems that can undermine the potential NATO advantage. The role of Russian electronic warfare, then, would include the mission of disorganizing the command and control of enemy troops and weapons by means of electronic defeat, something which would, in Lestochkin's words back in 2017, require the development of principally new means capable of neutralizing the enemy's, quote, technological and informational advantage, end quote. There is perhaps a broader point here about the way the Soviet armed forces and now the Russian armed forces have perceived themselves and understood their situation relative to that of NATO. You will sometimes see Russian propagandists or politicians declaring that Russia has the most powerful military in the world and could easily crush the West. But if you read into the thinking and statements of Soviet and Russian military leaders and where they choose to invest their money, then you'll see evidence the Soviets and Russia have often seen themselves as being the underdog in many capability areas. And so the focus has often been on counter capabilities that are often asymmetrically cheap rather than trying to match their opponents one to one. The Soviets couldn't outbuild the US carrier fleets, so they invested in missile cruisers and submarines instead. Soviet air forces didn't think they could realistically match the NATO ones, and so the Soviet Union ended up with the most extensive system of air defences in human history. And the modern Russian military doesn't seem to think it can match its opponents in areas like intelligence gathering and networking. They will of course still heavily invest in those capabilities because they're going to be very useful in a lot of scenarios, but they're going to plan around the possibility of being outmatched in any confrontation with NATO. And so the focus is instead on systems that contest or deny the spectrum, forcing everyone on the battlefield to fight in the proverbial electromagnetic shade like it's 1985. It'd be like one of the other teams in Formula 1 declaring they were sick of Red Bull and Verstappen winning all the time, so they were going to lay a bunch of anti-tank mines across the track and declare the race was going to take place on foot. Now, when talking about electronic warfare, and I'm going to focus on Russian electronic warfare specifically, there isn't really one individual vehicle or system you should point to and say that is probably the game changer. The Russian military has literally dozens of different EW systems available to it. There are those intended to intercept enemy communications, to fool GPS receivers, to jam or hijack drones or shut down enemy communications. These range from very expensive, often vehicle-based systems capable of doing things like interfering with some satellite broadcast in a limited area, jamming communications, or in the case of systems like R330, according to the Royal United Services Institute, having at least some impact on the GPS guidance of systems like the American JDAM. In Ukraine, Russia is believed to have used some of its systems to intercept Ukrainian radio communications, for example, and EW has been part of the Russian response to Ukrainian HIMARS strikes. But at the other extreme end of the spectrum, pun intended, Russia also has some very small and cheap EW systems. These include things like handheld drone jammers, or small systems intended to be fitted on vehicles or placed in a static position in order to defend a vehicle or an area against certain FPV drone threats. Because while FPV and drop drones are very much guided weapons, courtesy of the efforts of the pilot, they usually, with a few niche exceptions, cease to be guided the moment they lose that signal. And depending on the drone and EW system in question, it might sometimes be possible to force a drone to land or even to seize control of it entirely. In other cases, it might be possible to locate a drone's control station or operator, which is obviously a pretty big deal because while these drones may be cheap and replaceable, trained operators aren't. Taken together, EW might provide the means to degrade or defeat opposing drones at a minuscule fraction of the cost per engagement 
compared to something like a man-pads or larger anti-air missile. And so in Ukraine, electronic warfare has become the primary defence against many types of drone. In the earlier stages of the invasion, not all Russian units were well prepared for Ukrainian drone tactics. But as of 2023, it appears the threat was realised and adaptations put in place. Earlier this year, Rusi noted that, quote, the armed forces of the Russian Federation now employ approximately one major electronic warfare system per 10 kilometres of frontage, usually situated approximately 7 kilometres from the front line, with more specialised EW capabilities sat at a higher echelon. And as well as those larger and more expensive systems, we've also seen the Russians push smaller, cheaper systems down to lower and lower echelons. The Rusi report, in relation to these smaller counter-drone systems, notes, quote, Ukrainian forces now assess that at least one of these systems is available to each platoon within Russian line infantry units, end quote. Meaning that, in theory, every full-strength Russian infantry platoon should have at least something that it can use against marauding Ukrainian drones, even if the thing in question is just a simple handheld jammer. But that's still much better than many of the other anti-drone systems we see used in Ukraine, like the time Ukrainian troops reportedly took down a Russian quad rotor through the high-tech expedient of throwing a stick at it. As far as I can tell, there's no available data on whether or not it was a NATO-supplied stick, but no doubt the use of such dangerous and advanced weapons on the battlefield can only lead to further escalation. Jokes aside, and returning to e-war for a moment, it's worth noting you don't need your systems to actually knock down a drone in order for them to make a contribution. EW systems might also restrict the range a drone can fly, force an operator to use additional equipment and potentially get much closer to the front line than they would like, or to force constant adaptations and technical changes in response to the evolving threat. Building an FPV drone that is physically capable of flying 15 kilometres behind the line, for example, does not at all guarantee you'll be able to maintain signal at 15 kilometres behind the line when faced by enemy E-War assets. So not only does EW inflict attrition on the attacking drone force, it also helps take the edge off to slow the bleeding, to reduce the instances of successful attacks and make it harder to reach behind the lines. And without that break, without that constraint on how drones can operate, this would probably be even more of a drone war than it already is. Of course, performing those vital functions, countering drones, intercepting communications, or confusing GPS systems, all of that potentially puts electronic warfare systems at risk and makes them a priority target for Ukraine. As at time of recording, we have visual confirmation of about 60 Russian EW systems destroyed, damaged, or captured. And some of these are larger, more expensive systems like Boris Oglebsk or Palantin. And some of it is very new, very expensive, and only available in small numbers. Palantin, for example, is an operational tactical level system that despises shortwave and ultra shortwave communications and mobile phones, meaning that after this war is over, there might be a civilian dual use market for cinemas and libraries. The Russian military has said the system can suppress enemy radio communications and electronic intelligence systems in a 1,000 kilometer wide area, which would be pretty useful if true. But given the system was first seen in a training exercise in 2019, there's only so many of these things that can realistically exist, and the two on that list probably hurt. There's even a nominally higher echelon level system on that list, the Krasulka 4, which is usually operated, I believe, only by Russia's five electronic warfare brigades. And yet, in 2022, when everything was clearly going according to the Russian master plan, some genius decided to leave part of the system behind and allow it to be captured by the Ukrainians and then shipped off to the United States. Other EW systems have also been left abandoned to be captured. Getting your EW systems captured by the enemy is very much a no-no in most armies. It gives your opponents something to pull apart, analyse, test against, and a way to validate any potential countermeasures they might develop. So any Russian EW crew that abandons a modern system to be captured can probably report to the nearest American embassy for a cash prize and a green card. The key point here is that when you use these systems on the front line, you will inevitably lose some, and when you lose some, there's going to be an intelligence windfall for your opponent. Ukraine, for the most part, isn't going to have those same concerns because most of its EW assets are Soviet-made, and the Russians probably have a pretty good idea about how those things work by now. There are also questions around Russian and Ukrainian EW performance that probably merit investigation in a future episode. A lot of times, for example, we've seen systems knocked out by precisely the sort of weapons you'd expect them to defend against. GPS jammers killed by GPS-guided munitions, drone jammers killed by drones. But that's an interesting story that requires more than just the visual confirmation of the loss, so we'll come back to it again in future. What I will say is we have plenty of evidence of Russian EW being very, very effective, but at the same time also less effective than their pre-invasion claims suggested they would be. Back in 2019, for example, the Russian MOD claimed that its systems could provide comprehensive protection against air assets such as cruise missiles, airborne radars, and unmanned aerial vehicles. 
They described EW specialists as being able to create a safe space during exercises, protecting a zone against threats, including cruise missiles. Which does raise a question as to why valuable and obvious military targets, like warships in port or the headquarters of the Black Sea Fleet, have repeatedly been struck by, you guessed it, cruise missiles. The answer may be the system can't do what it's claimed it does, that there aren't enough systems available, or it may be the result, for example, of another problem. That problem is fratricidal jamming, which in turn is a fancy way of saying the Russians tend to jam themselves a lot. At least as of early 2023, a Rusi report described Russian practice in the following way. Quote, Interestingly, there is minimal interest among Russian crews in synchronising these effects with other activities or with deconflicting their effects. Instead, for the period when an EW team is deployed, it is weapons-free with its system and tends to aggressively attack Ukrainian systems. End quote. We've talked before about the phenomenon of fratricidal jamming in the early stages of the Russian invasion. When the EW crews got so trigger-happy, they reportedly had to be told to just stop jamming entirely for a while. But it does highlight a limitation and a complexity in how you choose to use electronic warfare assets. If you don't properly position them and coordinate their use, you're going to fry your own side as much as the opposition. But then again, one wonders if that would have really bothered the Russians in the context of a struggle against NATO as opposed to against Ukraine. Against an opponent with a lot of technological reliance and superior technology like NATO, jamming both sides is probably a net win for you. Against Ukraine, where in many cases Russia will have the technological advantage and dependency, jamming both sides may not be a net win. Deeply satisfying for the EW crews, no doubt, but not optimum from a tactical or operational perspective. But the reason I'm bringing up all these limitations about EW and EW systems is to establish why they probably don't represent an automatic I win button for peer conflict without taking away from the fact that in Ukraine, I would argue, they have been absolutely critical. In terms of effect, and arguably also in terms of efficiency, electronic warfare has been the decisive anti-drone weapon so far. We've talked previously about the Rusi estimate that in any given month, Ukraine might lose 10,000 UAVs, overwhelmingly small quad rotors and FPVs. Of those that are knocked out by enemy action, a majority are lost to EW. If you just compare the value of the drones to the value of the jammer, you might not think this is particularly efficient. After all, if I'm going to spend millions of US dollars equivalent on a high-end jammer, damn straight I expect it to be able to knock down a bunch of $600 drones. But the key here is that the EW system can provide a defensive bubble. It can knock down multiple drones. It isn't limited by its missile magazine the way a surface-to-air missile launcher is. And as a result, whether by knocking the drones down, seizing control of them, limiting their range, or otherwise imposing restrictive conditions on opposing drone operators, these systems might be helping to preserve hundreds of pieces of valuable military equipment and the lives of troops in the field. And it's here that that but-for test where you ask what would happen if the system or class of systems didn't exist is really, really important. Because if all electronic warfare systems were magically snapped out of existence in January 2022, yes, nothing is certain whenever you're dealing with hypotheticals, but it does seem reasonable to suggest the war that followed and continues would probably look somewhat different. Small commercial drones would have massively increased range and survivability, and as a result, drone saturation would be much, much higher than it currently is. Operators would be safer, and long-range FPV drones would be able to routinely strike at much longer distances. Drone operator safety would be much higher, meaning attrition would be lower. Training standards could come down, as you didn't have to teach people how to avoid or deal with defending electronic warfare assets. And all of the resources that currently go into designing and fielding systems that are at least somewhat hardened against opposing EW assets, well, those adaptations wouldn't need to happen. So in that sense, you could argue that electronic warfare isn't a game changer in the sense that it has made war unrecognisable or dramatically changed it, but rather because it has stopped other systems completely taking over the battlefield. EW provides one accessible and available countermeasure to an ever more present threat. And if the reporting we've seen from Ukraine is correct, and whenever one side's EW defences in an area crumble, at least temporarily, the costs imposed as drone operators temporarily gain massively increased freedom, well, let's just say that when people start slamming FPV drones into your seven-figure air defence system, that's a pretty heavy premium to pay for failure. It also explains why we're likely to continue to see adaptation and the battle of attrition play out on both sides each rolling out new systems and new production to protect vehicles and troops against opposing drones, while also prioritising enemy EW assets in order to make it open season for friendly drone operators. Russia, for example, appears to be testing the idea of placing vehicle-mounted jammers to protect against FPVs. 
If that happens, it in turn will invite technological innovation and countermeasures from the Ukrainians and the cycle will continue. And if the balance between UAS and counter-UAS ever gets too far out of whack, well, then we might see the game, so to speak, change once more. So if we return to our massively unscientific game-changer tier list, as I know we must, then I'm sorry, but I can't help but put all the systems that collectively make up Ukraine and particularly Russia's electronic warfare capability in that top-level S tier. They sit in their tier because their performance massively outstrips their public hype, their effectiveness has been widely reported, and in terms of efficiency, they remain one of the most cost-effective countermeasures to opposing drones or enemy networks. Trying to imagine this war without electronic warfare systems conjures a dystopian image of flocks of drones swarming over the battlefield with complete impunity, striking any exposed target they find with pinpoint uninterrupted precision. All while their numerous operators safely coordinate the ballet, casually employing unencrypted and uninterrupted communications, like colleagues remotely sitting in on a work call as opposed to a defending force opposing an invader. That to me is a pretty strong argument for that amorphous classification as a game changer. But if you think there's a compelling reason why I might be wrong on that front, please do let me know in the comments. In conclusion, while I'm still very much not a fan of the term game changer, I do think there's good reason to try and evaluate the impact of different systems in Ukraine. Today I tried to include some systems that I think have shaped the way the war has been fought, with a much bigger focus on things like networking and e-war that I don't think necessarily get a huge amount of public attention. I also tried to highlight the fact that context and opportunity cost matter. If Ukraine had MiG-31s and Kinsale missiles, it might be a significant boost in their capabilities. Meanwhile, for Russia, with its already well-developed missile arsenal and slew of alternatives, that same system might be a waste of resources. Ukraine's advantage in intelligence gathering might mean it can get more out of its Storm Shadow and Scout missiles, while Russia's greater available pool of fires means they're in a better position to capitalise on a system like Orlan than Ukraine likely would be. One of the keys going forward as nations decide what systems to send to Ukraine or what to invest in for their own national defence is to always try and see the big picture and not get tunnel visioned onto an individual system. It's important to understand the strategy in play, what capability is really needed, and then what system or collection of systems one can procure in order to efficiently get to where you need to be. In the end, the search for game changers is often going to rely a lot on the rules of the game being played. Okay, and let's add a quick channel update to close out. Firstly, thank you to all of you who voted in the topic poll, which led to this video being made. I hope you're happy with the results. Secondly, as promised, I want to provide a quick update on donations and charity for the channel. You might recall that when I did the video on Battlefield Medicine, I said that the proceeds would be donated and i provide an update in short order. In the end, the performance of that video did fall significantly short of a lot of my other productions, but in the end, that's obviously not the fault of those who are impacted by wars like the one in Ukraine. So I'm just going to pretend it did about quite as well as it actually did and send the money on its way this week. I try not to talk about this stuff too much because I don't want to come off as bragging, but just for the sake of transparency, I thought I'd give that update. For the patrons, once this video goes live, you should have a question up on the patron asking you about December content. And even though this video will be going up on the 12th of November, Australian time, it should still be the 11th in some places at time of release. I'll close out by saying not just that I hope to see you all again next week, but also, as I said earlier, lest we forget.